being successful in almost anything means having a passion for it. If you see somebody with even reasonable intelligence and a terrific passion for what they do and who can get people around them to march even when those people can't see over the top of the next hill, uh, things are going to happen. I mean, I can buy anything I want, the, 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 basically, but I can't buy time. Uh, and, and so to have time is the most precious it's, thing you can have. It, I better be careful with it. Yeah. Okay, okay, there's no way I will be able to buy more time. And living in Omaha makes that easier. That makes it a lot easier. I, I For 50, whatever <laughs> the it is. Same uh, yeah, 50, 50, well, then for 54 40, years, yeah, right. I've spent five minutes going each way. Now, just imagine that was a half an hour each way. You know, <laughs> I, I, I know the words to a lot more songs, and that's about it. <laughs> it adds up, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it really it adds up. up. No, if you're talking an hour a day difference, coming and going, and, you know, you, that's two and a half percent of the person's work week. <laughs> you know, that means 40 years you're talking about a year. <laughs> what brings you the most satisfaction beyond family? Well, my most greatest satisfaction is just staying in good health. <laughs> I mean, when you're 86, I mean, you, know, you look at this a little differently. <laughs> well, so, but, so you, you're in good health? Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I enjoy every day. I, I enjoy it. Well, what is it that you enjoy? Well, I enjoy running Berkshire. Yeah. I mean, if you get right down into my psyche, I mean, that's what I want to be. Yeah, no, it's 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 you know it it's been my painting for fifty some years. I get to paint what I want. I don't have to I don't have to do you know follow what uh, Wall Street is telling me to do next quarter or something like that. So I own the brush, I own the canvas, and the canvas is unlimited. Now that's a that's a pretty nice game, and I get to do it every day with people I like I don't have to I don't have to associate with anyone that causes my stomach to turn you know I, if I were in politics I'd have to smile at a lot of people that I want to hit you know you just so, don't, you just so don't go to them it's really I've got a good deal I'm gonna I'm hanging on to it <laughs> <laughs> I often repeat this story Brooke Ashton once said to me I spent too much of my life worrying about what people thought of me and then I only care about what I think of them now she was good I but only want to see but, people that I like yeah and my business is, is, I'm, I'm lucky that way. I mean, uh, bus business is so much easier than philanthropy. Philanthropy may be a whole lot more important, but in business, you're looking for kind of easy choices. You're looking for people that you can that you like to associate with. And I mean, you're to an extent, I can create the world around me. Are you me. saying to me that if somebody walked in your door and they offer, they want you to buy their company, and you saw it as a golden? A golden goose run goose. by it with a farmer I didn't run, like. Run, run, run. <laughs> yeah. I would say no. You'd say no. Because Even though you knew it would... Charlie, marrying for money is probably a bad idea under any circumstances, but if you're already rich, it does not make any <laughs> sense at all. <laughs> you believe in America. Absolutely. You, know, you have said to me more than once, uh, I would give up a year of my life just to know what the next 50 is going to be like. Yeah, even the next four now, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you pick four? <laughs> I don't know, just a number that came to me. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it, is, it is just fascinating what's yeah. happened just in my lifetime, you know, yeah. in, in the 86 years. I, I should mention one thing about reading. Uh, it was at the library here at Columbia yeah. that I wish I spent probably more time than any other uh, student. Uh, I, I, I lived there practically, but you know, I pulled the book out there, happened to be Who's an American, it told me something about my professor Benjamin Graham, and then I looked up and I went to the library and I said I want to look more, learn more about this because I learned this over here. That changed my whole life. You know, we own Geico now <laughs> uh, because of, uh, of that librarian directing me to some other book and then following through on that. Uh, it's the chance, I, I, I read about one-fifth the pace the bill does, but I still spend five or six hours a day reading. I mean, it just, you can learn so much. I particularly love biography, just, uh, you know, to be able to live the lives of these people that have been so, mm -hmm. seeing so extraordinary, the lessons and the, you know, the discouragements they face, just everything about it. So I just, I, you can't get enough of reading it. Uh, and I read the book when I was 19 called The Intelligent Investor, and I'd, I'd been interested in investments since I was maybe seven or eight, but I'd never, and I'd read every book in the public, all my public library by the time I was 11. So why do you think you were interested in investing when you were seven or eight? <laughs> because I was too dumb to get interested at four. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the, my dad, my dad had a very small investment firm, and I would just go down. I read all the books that he had there, you know, yeah. waiting to go to lunch or whatever it might be. And then I went to the public library and read them all, and, and it, it, it just was a fascinating subject to me. And and but I didn't have any. I, I, I knew what everybody thought and all of that at, at an early age, but what Graham wrote made sense. To investing per se, uh, did is there something about your core competence that made investing the perfect place for you to be? Yeah, I, I certainly wasn't to be a pro football player. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I looked, it was a question of zeroing out all the other incompetencies, you know, and I was left with one thing, you know. <laughs> the, uh, uh, no, I, I, just the I, allocation of it, capital. It, 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 I was actually wired in a way that was uh, this would be something I would be good at. So, what wired in what way? I I can't tell you precisely, but I, I I've got the right temperament for it, which is much more important than IQ. If you've got more than 120 points of IQ, so sell the rest to somebody else. You don't need it in investments, but but you do need the right temperament. You do it. You, you do have to be able to think for yourself. And getting back to you know the. the uh, earlier question. The first question I ask myself when I look at a business is, you know, is it important and easy what I can determine about this business? Yeah. And a lot of them don't make it. Now Bill is looking for hard questions that, that, that plague society and where intellect and money may make a difference. They may not for a while, and, uh, but he, he's taking on the tough things. I take, my job is to find easy things. I'm looking for one foot bars to step over, you know, rather than eight foot bars to jump over, you know. <laughs> and, but that's not irrational if you're, yeah. if you're looking at the investment universe. Mm -hmm. uh, but reading is key. I, on, the biography, uh, on, the, on the book thing, I, the, I, you can learn so much. My partner, Charlie Munger, just loves Ben Franklin, you know, I mean, yeah. he, I mean you know, he could, uh, it, it, you can learn from other people and, uh, and their mistakes, and, and I find bi biography is my favorite. Warren, you have often said you still tap dance to work Absolutely. because you can paint with your own colors. Yeah, I, I, I get, I, I'm as excited about tomorrow in terms of what's going to happen as I was when I started. I was having a lot of fun when I started, but I'm having just as much fun uh, now. And, and I was, when I was here at Columbia, I, I had this terrible fear. Of, it, was, it was impossible for me to speak in public. I mean, I wasn't able to do it. I actually read an ad in the New York Times. I went down to Midtown, signed up for a course, gave the guy a check, and then stopped payment on the check. I mean, it just, I just petrified. But finally, I, and, and actually, after you get through with here, hearing me today, maybe you'll wish I'd stayed afraid of public speaking, but that's another question. <laughs> then, when I got out to Omaha, I finally decided I just had to do it, so I gave a guy $100 in cash, and once I parted yeah. with $100 in cash, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd jump off the Grand Canyon to get my money's worth. So, it, it, <laughs> but it, cha it changed my life, but I would say this, don't fear failure. Almost everything that's turned out, I got turned down by Harvard, the best thing that ever happened. Uh, among others, some good things that happened that didn't seem good at the time. Don't worry about it. And don't don't let it eat at your look back. Just keep going because you're going to have some things and forget them. Go go forward. <laughs> All right, I want to go to the back of the room, right back there, wherever number three is. Hi, my name is Matthew Mann. I'm a first year at Columbia Business School. Both of you had a moment where you went out on your own, and I guess my question would be. If you were to do it all over again, you're in our shoes, what industry would that be in? Where would you start your own business today? I'd do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> but one thing, I'd be a failure at anything else probably. I mean, I'm not gonna, no, I mean, I have had, I had fun when I was in my 20s, my 30s, now I'm 86 and I'm having fun. And so I, I advise students as much as possible Look for the job that you would take if you didn't need a job. I mean, you know, don't sleepwalk through life and don't don't say it's all going to be great. You know, I'll, I'll do this and I'll do that. And, you know, I'm just marking time to get to be older. That, as I've told people, that's like saving up sex for your old age. I mean, it just is not a, it is, it is not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. What, what, what are you urging them to do? I'm, I'll explain it. Just what I'm talking about. Now, it, it, it you just, yeah. you really want to be doing what you love doing, and you can't necessarily find it on your first job, right. but don't give up before you find it. The difference between now and 60 or 70 years ago in the ability of 
really bright people, really innovative, really energetic people to get financed to do things is, is just dramatically better than, than it was at that time. So now, if you've got good ideas, and there's good ideas right in this crowd, and you've got energy, it's far easier to get financed to move forward those ideas than you could 50 or 60 years is ago. Is that because of the internet or crowdsourcing? Of what is it? It's just lots more capital lots more around capital. and people more optimistic yeah. about... It, 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 people are very optimistic about and, business. And, but better ways to connect the two, yeah, the capital and those absolutely. and the it's ideas. Dr it's dramatic. Uh, many industrial-based communities have been severely affected with higher levels of unemployment due to the increasing utilization of automation, which ends up displacing workers. What do you believe, it, what do you believe is a possible solution to unemployment arising from automation? How technology and the impact technology is having on jobs and, and the demand for new kinds of skills. Yeah, and we were here in 1800 and conducting this. Uh, and somebody would point out that uh, eventually tractors would come along and, and better fertilizer and everything, and that 80% of the people are now employed on the farm. And in a couple hundred years, it's going to be 2 or 3%. And what are we going to do with all these people? Well, the answer is we release them. We, Keynes wrote something about it in something called Essays on Persuasion. He wrote in 1930 about what a more prosperous society would become like. And he actually postulated that uh, in a hundred years, and we're now 87 years away from them, that there would be four to eight times as much output per capita. And, you know, he's remarkable, uh, but he, he didn't quite get out, might get distributed. But the idea of more output per capita, which is what the progress has made on productivity, that that should be harmful to society is, is crazy. I mean, the, the distribution may be a problem, but if one person could push a button and turn out everything we turn out now, is that good for the world or bad for the world? You know, you'd have to figure out how to distribute it, but but you'd free up all kinds of possibilities for everything else. So you, every everything should be devoted initially to getting greater productivity, but people who fall by the wayside through no fault of their own, as the goose lays more golden eggs, should still get a chance to participate in that prosperity. And that's where government comes in. Whether you're going to make an investment in a company or whether you're going to buy the company, what are the factors that you have to be, that you're looking for? What I, test? I'm looking for durable competitive advantage. I'm looking for something that has a moat around it for a considerable period of time. And I'm looking for an, an honest and able management to run it because I don't know how to run it myself. And I'm looking for a, a purchase price that's not excessive, but it's better to pay a little too much for something that's a very good business uh, than it is to buy some bargain, uh, but really a company without much of a future. And I don't know, I don't have a ability to predict with a high, a high probability of success the future of most companies. So I'm looking for the exception. But the nice thing is, if there's thousands of companies out there, I really don't have to be right on a couple. I mean, it, it, it's exactly the opposite of, of baseball, where you have called strikes, and the pitcher's trying to throw it to you at the worst part of the strike zone for you. And if he succeeds in getting into that corner three times and you don't swing, you're out. And, and investing, it's a no, it's an old called strike yeah. thing. So I can sit there all day and somebody can throw me one company after another, and finally I get one in my sweet spot. Uh, both of you have chosen both wives and partners well. Um, Charlie Munger added what to you? Oh, Charlie Munger changed my views. I mean, he refined them in a huge way in terms of looking for the quality companies and, and, and looking for the ability to make an investment that would work out well for five or ten or twenty years as opposed to something that might, there might be one I call it cigar butt investing, where there was one puff left in the cigar, but the cigar was free, so you picked up these disgusting looking things and got one puff out of them and went onto another one. And that worked okay, but it was small scale, and it really doesn't build something satisfying. So, so he, he kept forcing me in the direction of saying, you know, is this a, a really a business we want to own for forever? And, and uh, do we want to get associated? It's like a marriage. I mean, do you want to get associated with this person forever? And uh, it's a great way to look at things. It's more fun with a partner. I mean, Charlie and I have had more fun working together than either one of us would have had individually, and we have never had an argument after working together for 58 years. You talk every day? Not anymore, because we know what the other guy's going to say. We just <laughs> grunt. Uh, <laughs> well, my own personal thought is that every life is of equal value. And uh, in many ways,
in many ways, if you have a limited number of dollars, you actually can do more for more people outside the United States. We do have greater resources here for our 320 million people than exists around the world for seven plus billion people. So if, if you, you can improve the lot of more people by intelligently spending a billion dollars or any other number uh, in other areas of the world actually than here. And I, uh, you know, I, coming from Omaha and having the money, I have people who can say, well, why not spend it all in Omaha? You know, you grew up here and Omaha's done all kinds of things for you. And I absolutely acknowledge that. But in the end, if I've got X dollars to spend, I can make life better for more people if I can have it intelligently allocated in other parts of the world, actually, than the United States. And that draws a fair amount of criticism, but, you know, I, I live with it because I, that's just what I believe. All lives have equal value is really the driving force Absolutely. behind I mean, I, foundation. I, I'm an accident. I, I, I won the ovarian lottery when I was born in the United States in 1930. It was 40 to 1 against me. I was male. That now it's 80 to 1 against being a male in the United States in 1930. I was just plain lucky. My life had been far different. Bill always said if I had been born a long time ago, I'd have been some animal's lunch because I can't run fast and I can't climb trees and everything else. And I'd be saying, I allocate capital, I allocate capital, you know. <laughs> it wouldn't work. And, you know, I was lucky. But uh, 79 out of the 80 weren't as lucky as I was at that yeah. time. If you go back 100 or 150 years, people got wealthy by making some money from the first oil refinery or still a mill and building another one and Henry Ford would build a plant to build cars and then they'd, it would be from actually from retained earnings which eventually turned into cash. Now you can get rich very young just by having an idea right. and you can get that idea monetized and capitalized in a way that you cannot believe. So we are particularly interested in getting younger people interested in, in philanthropy because they, there will be huge, there are huge fortunes by people that are now in their 20s and 30s and just think about those, the potential for that group. And so this thing has worked out way, way better, including getting younger people uh, to join us. Are there any major life lessons that you two have learned through your personal experiences? Well, it's a very important question. And the more <clears throat> you will move in the direction of the people that you associate with. So I, it's important to associate with people that are better than yourself and actually the most important decision many of you make not all of you will be the spouse you choose right. and uh, you really you want to associate with people who are the kind of person you'd like to be you'll, you'll move in that direction and the most important person by far in that respect is your spouse I, I can't overemphasize how important that is and you're right the, the friends you have uh, they will form you as you go through life and uh, uh, make some good friends, keep them for the rest of your life, but have them be people that you admire as well as like. <laughs> you have said to me about Susie, your late wife, I was a mess until I met Susie. I think that's understating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she changed my life. I mean, there's no question about that. How did she that. change your life? Well, I was a very lopsided not well-adjusted person who happened to be very good <laughs> at one thing and and she put me together I mean and, and it wasn't it wasn't overnight either I mean but she just had that little sprinkling can you know and finally she saw a few sprouts come was up. it a coming together of opposites or no no I wouldn't say that we had we, we had very similar value we were in sync yeah. big uh, in, a, in a very big way and and uh, uh, but I she was way more mature than I was. She was 19 when we got married. I was 21, but I, I was I was about 12 <laughs> emotionally, and and she put me together and took yeah. it, it, like I say, it took time, but that it, it changed my life. I mean, it, 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 I would I would not have been had rough anything like the life I had. And, and, and what did Charlie Munger add? Well, Charlie Munger is my partner of partner. of 57 or 58 years, and. And he's extremely wise. He's a wonderful friend. We've been partners that time. And he's strong-minded. I'm strong-minded. We disagree. Sometimes we have never had an argument in that whole time, and we never will. And never had an argument. Never had an argument. I will. I, that's absolutely true. You, you must disagree on it. Absolutely. We disagree. But so we, if you disagree, how do you decide to? Well, what he says at the end is, uh, uh, when we disagree, he says, well, Warren, you'll end up agreeing with me because you're smart and I'm right. <laughs> You know, I mean, where do I attack that particular problem? <laughs> but and right, often he is. Often you'll he, figure out I'm right. Often, often he's right. I yeah. have to say that. No, I, I listen. I respect his opinion enormously. Whenever he gives it to me, I respect Bill's opinion. I mean, it's. But 
it's a, it's more fun doing things with partners. I mean, the most fun is is, is obviously a marriage partner, uh, and that's the most important relationship. But but having having a business partner. If I'd done everything I'd done, it wouldn't have worked out this way. But let's say I got double the results. It's been more fun doing it with Charlie. <laughs> Are you interested in technology? Uh, I, I I don't have enough. I, I don't think I have a natural uh, bent that way to start with. And I'm, I'd be so far behind. I never would catch up with people with, that have been working on it. And, and they, they, it would not be a game I it, would be winning. It is a principal criteria for you understanding the business. Yeah, I have to understand the business. And there are lots of businesses that I don't understand. Some of them may be almost under ununderstandable and others are just out of, outside my sphere of confidence but you do have people now that that do have that kind of expertise or there you have brought in I have two people who themselves have different circles of competence but they aren't chosen because they have a different circle I think there's a lot of overlap there's overlap between them and the important thing you know is not how it, it's nice to have a huge circle of competence it's much more important to know where the where the, where, the, where the limits are of it I was genetically blessed with a certain wiring that's very useful in a highly developed market system where there's lots of chips on the table and uh, you know I happen to be good at that game. Ted Williams wrote a book called The Science of Hitting and in it he had a uh, picture of himself at bat and the strike zone broken into I think 77 squares and he said if he waited for the pitch that was really in a sweet spot he would bat 400 and if he had to swing at something on the lower corner he would probably bat 235 and in investing i'm in a no called strike business which is the best business you can be in i can look at a thousand different companies and i don't have to be right on every one of them or even 50 of them so i can pick the ball i want to hit and the trick in investing is just to sit there and watch pitch after pitch go by and wait for the one right in your sweet spot. And if people are yelling, swing you bum, ignore them. There's a temptation for people to act far too frequently in stocks simply because they're so liquid. Over the years, you develop a lot of filters. And I do know what I call my circle of competence. So I, I, I stay within that circle and I don't worry about things that are outside that circle. Defining what your game is, where you're going to have an edge is enormously important.